morning again to any of you watching online who have just joined us. Now, I'm not um, foolish enough to think that everyone remembers uh, what I say in my homilies, but if you did connect with my Christmas homily, I hope that you remember the basic theme, or at least the title of that homily, which was, or the theme of the homily, which was about how to have the best Christmas ever. And if you are interested in how to have the best Christmas ever, you can go back and check it, check, check it out. So in the spirit of that homily, I thought about on this kind of hybrid day where we celebrate both the, the motherhood of Mary, Mary the mother of God, and the fact that it's New Year's Day on this hybrid day, I thought I would present a homily on the theme of how to have the best year ever, because it is the first day of a brand new year. I saw a meme last night that I tweeted that showed a picture of, of, of Homer, Sim Homer Simpson screaming in frustration, and it, the meme said, when you realize that 2022 is, sounds like 2022. Um, so that's not the kind of year that we hope to have, but it's been a, a heck of a past year, and as we go into this new year, I mean, the, ob the obvious thing is that I, I think we we're, we're all have a hope that 2022, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna kick COVID out, right? And I think that, you know, it's my very uneducated opinion here, but, but from what we see in the news from around the world, in the early indicators, we still need more time for the, the scientists to evaluate, but it does seem very much that Omicron actually could end up being good news. Highly contagious, not very dangerous, giving people immunity. This could be the last round, right? And we're going to win. We're going to beat this thing. But you know something? Even if it's not over as quickly as we would think, I think what I propose to share with you today can still help each and every single one of us in spite of the frustrations. And I heard a lot of it with people coming in today, just, oh, we're just so tired of all this stuff, I know. But I, I, I think that the core idea that I present today can help us have the best year ever, no matter what. Now let's look at the feast day today. Today's feast day really goes back, the origin of it goes back to the, the early church, really to the, to the, the fourth century, uh, the, the fourth and fifth centuries. Uh, and it had to do with the denial of a title of Mary that had been used for, for many, many generations that people called her the mother of God. In Greek, it, was, it, meant, it meant literally the God-bearer. And there were some people who said, you know, you can't call her that. You shouldn't call Mary the mother of God. How can a creature give birth to a divine person? She, was, she gave Jesus his human nature. You, could, you should call her the mother of Jesus, not the mother of God. And there was a lot of people got really upset about that, not just because it's what they had been calling her for a long time, but because they had a sense that, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense, because ultimately the, the reality of the incarnation, the fact that we believe that God took flesh and was born of a woman, as it says in the second reading today, and that he was a divine person. Like it actually means, the consequence of the incarnation actually means that yes, Mary actually gave birth to God. I mean, I know that's crazy. But that's the consequence of the incarnation. In the early church, they knew that. And when this title of Mary, this ancient title was affirmed, it was seen as the conclusion of something, kind of like the fullness of the understanding of what the incarnation was all about. But this feast day, uh, has been celebrated throughout the centuries of the church, not just celebrating M Mary's maternity, but up until the early 1960s, this feast day was called the, the Feast of the Circumcision. In our gospel today, we heard that Jesus was taken to the temple on the eighth day, which, I mean, Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Everyone knows that, right? Okay, we don't know actually when he was born, but this is, today is the eighth day after the celebration of his birth. That's why we had the gospel reading today. And it's still celebrated as such in the Anglican Church, the Orthodox Church, the, the circumcision of Jesus. And so that's part of our tradition as, as well. And also, it was the day in which Jesus received his name. He was named. They gave him the name which the angel gave him. 
the name Yeshua, the name that means God saves, the salvation of God. And if we're going to experience the best year ever, regardless of what's going to happen with COVID, it has to do with God's salvation. We often think of God's salvation as something that happens in the future when we die. And certainly we believe that the fullness of salvation will be experienced there, but the re reality of grace that we, what we believe as Christians means that, no, salvation begins now, in the present moment. We, we live in salvation in the present moment, and we can experience it presently in our lives. And I believe if we do experience God's salvation, it does allow us to say that this, this is going to be the best year ever. So in order to explore what this salvation means, I want to take some time to delve into the second reading today from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, a very important passage because it actually chronologically is the first mention of Mary in the New Testament. Because remember, St. Paul's letters were are the oldest parts of the New Testament, especially Galatians is one of the first letters that St. Paul wrote. It's not the first, but one of the first. And he talks about the woman. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman born under the law. The woman. I mean, this is the ancient title of, the, of referring to Eve, going back to the book of Genesis. Full of meaning. The woman. God sent his son, he was born of a woman and born under the law so he could liberate, so he could redeem people from the law. Now, we, we have a hard time understanding this law thing because we don't come from a Jewish background. But this was the context of the early church. Most of the early Christians, most of them initially were, were all Jewish people who had lived under the law. And St. Paul was the one who, who grappled with the theological consequence of salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, this gets a little bit complicated. Let me try to explain it as simply as I can. In the Jewish understanding, we were brought into right relationship with God through keeping the law, through keeping all of these rules and regulations. And there were many of them, like hundreds and hundreds. And the first one was, at least for males, was circumcision. So Jesus is born under the law. He circumcised the mark of the law. And the idea was that if you kept all of these rules, you were, you were good with God. And St. Paul makes the case that the problem with this is that no one was able to keep all the rules. And so the law actually ended up revealing to ourselves our inability to do what God calls us to do. It reveals to us our need for salvation. And the law, in a sense, becomes a kind of curse. We become slaves to it. And that's why St. Paul would teach that, that we're not saved through keeping the law, but through faith that works itself out in love. Faith, trust in God that leads us to love God and love others. That's where salvation is. Putting our trust in God. It's not what we do for God, it's what God has done for us. St. Paul would preach about the, 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 the reality of grace, the primacy of grace, that the life of the Spirit is a life of grace. And he says that Jesus came to, to free us from slavery. We've been set free, and he uses the image of slavery. Now, we're not very familiar with slavery today, but back in the time of Jesus, in the time of St. Paul, slavery was everywhere. I mean, either you were a slave or you owned a slave. I mean, even the poor owned slaves. I mean, they had Walmart slaves. You know what I mean? But there was like boutique slaves. Like there was, there was slaves for everyone. Everyone had slaves. It was just accepted. You either were a slave or you owned a slave. And anyone could become a slave. You know, if you ran up your visa card and didn't pay it off, you could sell yourself into slavery and, and work off your, what, what you owed. And so that was quite common. And so the image here of being redeemed from slavery, because back then, if you were a slave, someone could come and say, hey, Elizabeth, how much do you owe? okay, I'm going to write a check. I don't know if they wrote checks back then, but I'm going to pay your debt and you will be liberated from slavery. And that's what St. Paul says. He says, Jesus has paid the debt. He's liberated us 
so that we're no longer slaves. And by the way, St. Paul also says this, Jewish people were enslaved to the law, but non-Jews, the Gentiles, are enslaved to many things too. We're enslaved to, 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 the, to sin, we're enslaved to the, our, our fallen human nature, to our, our passions, our desires. Everyone is enslaved to something. Jesus wants to free us from slavery. It's the first part of salvation, to be freed from slavery. Secondly, St. Paul says this, not only are we freed from slavery, we've received the spirit of adoption. Literally, it says sonship. It says, the Lord has put, Jesus has put his spirit, so the spirit of Jesus has been placed in us, which cries out, Abba, Father. This was the Aramaic word Abba, which had a, an intimate sense of relationship with the Father. So the Spirit of Jesus is put into our hearts and cries out, Abba, Father. And we become adopted. We're adopted into God's family. So think about this. Imagine you're a slave and all of a sudden someone comes along and pays your debt and sets you free. That's a pretty good day, isn't it? Wouldn't that make your day? But not only have you been set free from slavery, all of a sudden you get handed a certificate of adoption. You've been adopted into not any family, but into the royal family. And not just any royal family, but the royal family. You're adopted into God's family. That's making your day even, be even more better, isn't it? Is that good grammar? Anyway. But it makes it a pretty good day. And Saint, so St. Paul talks about that we become sons. Now we may say, well, that's kind of a bit sexist. The translation did add in, in one place daughters, but it talked about sons. We become a son. But see, there's a reason why St. Paul says that is because it has to do with the next part of salvation. It has to do with getting the inheritance, the, being an heir in that culture, only sons receive the inheritance. And what St. Paul's saying is, through the spirit of adoption, we all become sons, male or female, Gentile or, 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 or Jew, slave or free, we all become sons because God wants to give us the inheritance. We all inherit, we all become heirs, every single one of us. Heirs of the kingdom of God. So not only have we been set free from slavery, not only have we been adopted into the family of God, we've become heirs. And not only that, St. Paul doesn't say it here, but he says it, says it elsewhere. Not only have we become heirs of, to, to get the inheritance, we get a down payment on the inheritance. An advance payment. This is sounding even better, isn't it? I mean, talk about a good day. And the advance payment is the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what St. Paul says. The gift of the Holy Spirit poured into our hearts. He says it here. He says it in several other places. In Romans 5.5, 5, uh, St. Paul says this, that the Spirit of God has been, uh, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is the, is the Spirit of Jesus. It's, it's described in different ways in, in the New Testament, but also here described as God's love being poured into our hearts. God's love, which is the person of the Holy Spirit, being poured into our hearts. That's the down payment. And that changes everything. That's what, that experience of God's love being poured into our hearts is what liberates us from whatever slavery we experience. It's what allows our spirit and God's spirit to cry out together, Abba, Father. It helps us to know that we are adopted sons and daughters and to know that we have an inheritance. That is the experience of salvation. That is the experience that if we can remain in that space in some way, we will experience the salvation that God wants for us. God's love poured into our hearts. You know, someone once said that the deepest desire of the human heart is to know that we're loved. Think about that for a second. Isn't it true? I mean, I often think that 
underneath a lot of our activity, a lot of our frenzied activity, a lot of our, our consuming and our buying and our, the choices that we make, whether it's the, the clothes we wear, the house we live in, the car we drive, the, what, the relationships we pursue, our pastimes, like underneath so much of what we do is one question often unasked, and that is, do you love me? Will you accept me? Am I acceptable? That's the question that we're asking, whether we're aware of it or not. I think children are much more open about asking that question than, than, than we adults. Because the deepest desire of the human heart is to know, to truly know, not just here, but to, to know here that we're loved. And that knowledge comes to us when we experience the down payment of the inheritance that is ours because we're adopted children who have been set free from slavery. The Spirit of God being poured into our hearts. And so in conclusion, I invite you today, in the coming days, in the coming weeks, to seek this experience of God's Spirit coming uh, through a simple and ancient prayer of the church, which is simply, come Holy Spirit. Three simple words, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, to pray it. You know, as soon as you wake up in the morning, come Holy Spirit. If you're, you know, having a difficult time, you're walking into a difficult situation, pray to the Holy Spirit. Often we don't pray to the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit to come, fill my heart. Help me to cry out, Abba, Father. Help me to know who I am. Help me to be set free from the things that, that enslave me. Help me to know that I am yours. Come, Holy Spirit. Let's make that the prayer for 2022 so that no matter what happens, COVID or whatever, it will be the best year ever.